I love the book of Joshua. It was the first book of the Bible that I ever outlined. I was writing a Sunday school series and years ago, back in, it was probably like 1999, 98 or 99, and I just, I wrote a, I outlined the entire book for Sunday school. I love it. It's, it's one of my favorites just because uh, God, God helps Joshua so much and Joshua's not perfect, but man, he sure is trying to do something for God. And that's most of us that have decided that we want to be serious. We're not perfect, but we're sure trying to see what we can do for the Lord. In Joshua chapter number 24, thank you for standing. We're going to begin reading in verse number 13. God is uh, outlining, speaking to and through Joshua here, and, and he's telling the people and reminding them what he's done for them throughout history and, and, and uh, not, so, not so distant history. And so uh, as he's speaking to them, we'll just pick up in the middle and he says, and I have given you land for which you did not labor and cities which you built not, in verse 13. And ye dwell in them of vineyards and olive yards which you planted not, do ye eat. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord." And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwelt in the land. Therefore, we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. Now, we'll stop right there. The people have made a choice. In the very next verse, Joshua says, no, you can't even serve the Lord. He's too good for you. But they, they, they want to serve the Lord. And he says, you're, you know, you're witnesses against yourselves. If you say you're going to serve the Lord, serve the Lord. The only thing worse than somebody who won't submit and serve the Lord is somebody who says they're going to do it and then doesn't. I'd rather take somebody that was at least honest and said, no, I'm just not interested in serving the Lord. At least you know what those people are about. What's worrisome in this world that we live in today is so many people who want to identify with Christ with their mouth, but not their life. Bless God, we ought to get... Just hammer down, man. Just put your foot on the pedal and just mash it and let's go. Just full throttle till Jesus comes. He's going to come take us out of this mess. I believe that. But until then, man, we ought to just go as far and as fast as we can, do as much as we can, glorify him, praise God. Just glorify him in our lives. I want to preach on this thought. Don't make decisions in the valley. Don't make decisions in the valley. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. I do pray that you would bless your word, the preaching of it. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would make the way up and down each aisle, each row. Speak to hearts and that you might have your perfect way and will in each life represented here today. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. You can be seated. We definitely love the Lord. And we've seen God do some crazy and mighty things. We've seen things that uh, we, we have actually been hesitant to share with other people just because people already think you're crazy enough. But then, man, when you tell them what God's done, sometimes they think you're even, even more crazy. But most of the time we still tell them because it, it's just a good testimony for the Lord. But you know, a lot of people make decisions during bad times. Can I tell you, it's 
not the right time to consider having a spare tire in your car and having a, a nice floor jack when you're sitting in a ditch with a flat tire? That's not the time to think, you know what, I should have a real nice spare tire. When you hear that thunk, 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 and smoke's coming off your tire, we were coming back from uh, Arkansas the other day, and uh, all of a sudden, you, you know, you smell that smell of burning rubber. If you're not at the drag strip, that's a bad smell. <laughs> and I said, I saw a little wisp of smoke. I said, oh, man, I think that 18-wheeler's about to pop a tire. But I was looking. I didn't see that little wooka, wooka, wooka on there, you know. And so we was watching, and so I just backed up. Because last thing you want is a big old chunk of tire coming off and, and hitting you. And that, I've been right next to one when it popped, and that's a blessing. You don't want to relive too many times. So we started backing off, and it was a car that was next to him, but it, that car, it was going, man. He was real aggressive driving. Boy, he was, I mean, he was impressing everybody with his amazing skills. And he was putting that car where it ought not have gone and cutting people off. And, man, here, they, here it comes. All of a sudden, the smoke, and that was not a good time for him to go, you know, I wonder if I have a spare in this car. I wonder if I have AAA. <laughs> it's not the time. Think our church family knows me. So we've had AAA for 15 years, amen? And uh, just because they know that uh, if there's a, a road, I'll take it. If there's a hill, I'll climb it. If there's a mountain, I may roll off of it. We're going we're gonna to do something. So AAA we have, we have jacks and we know, make sure we have everything that we need. And it's important every time you go get your, every time you go get your oil changed, you ought to make sure they check your spare tire, make sure it's still holding air and all that. And uh, it's just smart things to do. You, you don't want to decide whether you're going to be prepared for something when you're in the middle of a problem. There's a lot of people that wait until they're in the middle of the problem before they make a real decision. Tough times are coming. Can I just help you with that? I don't want to discourage. I love to encourage people. But let me help you today. I don't care who you are. Tough times are coming. You may have just come out of some tough times. You might be right in the middle of some tough times. But regardless of where you're at right now, there's still some tough times ahead. Unless your left ventricle slams shut on the way out the door and you're dead before you hit the ground, there's tough times coming. Just the way it is. There's an ebb and flow in our lives. There's peaks and there are valleys. And listen, I love mountains, but there's nothing grows on top of the mountain. Everything grows down in the valley. Why? Because everything rolls downhill, and that's where all the fertilizer is. And so as we go through this life, you trudge it through some fertilizer, trudge it through the valley, and you wish you was on the mountain, but you ain't got time for the mountain. Nothing grows up there anyway. All the work gets done down in the valley. And so in that valley, as we look around, listen, you had better be ready for the problems that come ahead. The Bible is full of examples. I like Daniel. Do you know Daniel? There he was just serving an evil king. He's a captive. May have already been made a physical eunuch. Boy, that ain't that terrible. And there he is just serving along, doing what he's supposed to do. And some bad guys trick the king into creating a law. Oh, king, live forever. We want to make a new law for 30 days that nobody can pray to nobody except you. And the king, in all, his hum in all of his humility, said, oh, yes. That seems like a wise decision. I think that's a fantastic idea. We ought to make a law that nobody can pray to anybody. Now, can I tell you, Long before that law got made, Daniel was already prepared. You go back to Daniel chapter number one, he had already purposed in, in his heart that he wasn't having none of the king's foolishness. He wasn't going to eat his junk food. He wasn't going to drink his alcohol. And he wasn't fitting to pray to nobody except his God. And so there he was. He had already made a decision. He had already 
prayed up. He was ready to go. And when the law changed, when the government changed, when everything changed on him and, and it, that people were turning on him, he didn't hesitate one little bit. He didn't even go pray in the room that didn't have a window. Daniel just went back to praying right where he was always at. Why? The last thing he wanted his God to think was that he was a coward. What does God think about us today? Daniel wasn't thinking to be a coward in front of his God. So he went, opened the window up, and just prayed right where he always prayed. They saw him, they turned him in, and all that. It didn't matter, he was already prepared. And he took a stand, and he was willing. There's so many. Elijah. You know, he didn't learn to trust God when there was 400 prophets of Baal up on top of Mount Carmel. He, he, he wasn't trying to figure the situation out uh, when they were, they were preparing the sacrifices. He already knew that his God could do something. He already knew that the 400 prophets of Baal had nothing. They were just empty windbags. They were clouds without water. It was showtime, but they couldn't do anything. So he called them out knowing God could do something. He was ready before the problem presented itself. The Apostle Paul, we've been studying about him in Sunday school. Paul didn't decide he was going to be bold when he was standing in a courtroom. He decided he was going to be bold long before he ever made it into a courtroom. And Paul stood strong and bold no matter what would happen. Apostle Paul had already experienced the road to Damascus. What will thou have me to do? Made everybody around him nervous. But Paul was doing real good. He, hands weren't shaking a bit. He was steady and ready for anything. I like David. David's at home watching the sheep. All of his older brothers are out fighting for Saul. Daddy says, hey man, why don't you grab a bunch of these cheese and bread Lunchables, run out there, take them to the fellas and see what they, what's happening out there. Time to refresh them, you know. So he shows up and he's like, who likes the one with the ham in it? Who likes the one over here? We can't have the ham in it. Give that back. Who wants like, he, he's out there passing out, you know, cheese and bread and he's trying to be a, an encouragement and you know he shows up out on the battlefield they're there at the valley of Elah and, and, and they've got boy here's a battle set, the, 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 the Hebrews on this side got everything set in array the Philistines on the other side their battle set in array and here comes this big dumb Philistine and he's running his mouth meanwhile David's down here just going here I'm trying to give out some cheese and some bread why are you guys not bloody why are there no Philistine guts on your swords? Why do you guys look so clean but so scared what's going on? And he found out what was going on. They were running up on about day 40 of this big dumb Philistine walking in there. I defy the armies of Israel. Mocking our God. David said, why is nobody killing him? And the people are like, oh, you know what? He, he, you... You just better shut up, little boy. And all of a sudden, somebody said, Hey, where's your older brother? Eliab, Eliab! Have you heard what your little brother? My little brother's taking care of his sheep. No, he ain't. He's over here with cheese and bread. Comes over there and he's like, Bubba, why aren't you bloody? Where, why isn't your sewer all? Got Philistine guts on it. Why are you hiding? Did I just see you hiding? That Philistine came out. Were you hiding back there, you, you older brother? And he goes, I know thy heart and thy naughtiness. Who, who'd you leave those few sheep with? You little worthless nothing. You just came out here to see a fight. Bless God, I know that's right. That's what he should have seen was a fight. Yeah. We were setting a battle in the rain, weren't we? David said, is there not a cause? He was discouraged by the soldiers. He was discouraged by his own brothers. So they sent him to the king to get some blessing. Here, king. Got a mighty warrior for you. <laughs> Little ruddy fella. Oh, he's pretty. He's talking about he wants to fight. And the king says, sonny boy, you can't fight. You're but a child and he's been a champion since his youth. 
You can't do that. David didn't even, he didn't go, oh, I didn't realize that was how I went. Instead, David said, no, listen, I was out keeping my father's sheep. And a bear came up and a lion came up and you could ask them except they was dead because I killed them. And if I can kill a lion and a bear, I reckon I can go out there and take care of this one too. The king says, you can't do it. He said, I'm going to do it. That's what I'm going to do. I'm about to walk out there right now. He said, well, here in that case, why don't you just put on your, some armor? Let me give you my armor. Let me give you my sword. Little, little youth clanging around in that stuff. David said, I, I can't use this stuff. What are you going to use? I'm going to use what I did before. God's going to take care of this. Walks out, picks him up some smooth stone. See, David would have never been ready to fight and defeat Goliath. Now, David was no fool. He knocked Goliath down and he hit him in the head. But David had probably seen some folks get hit in the head and get back up again. So David went over, took Goliath's own sword and hacked his stinking head off. Yeah. Like, like this, king, how about that? Hey, David never has this moment. But what, he had already been prepared by fighting lions and bears. All right. The time to decide, oh, do I really want to go out and battle? Do I, can, I, can I do this? I don't know. What can I use in a battle? I've got to make a decision here. You can't do that when the giant's calling you out. Hey, or else you'll be hiding like all the other cowards. If you're going to do something for God, hey, you better do the little things now so you'll be ready for the big things later. Do the little things now. Moses. One day he comes up. He's got the Red Sea in front of him. The Egyptian army coming up behind him. That wasn't a time for Moses to go, well, gee, I just wonder what, I wonder if God could do anything here in this situation. He said, be still. See the salvation of the Lord. He knew God was going to do something. God, had, you know, the people, listen, they murmured and they, that's just, just, you know they were part independent Baptist. That's how they are. They just complain and complain. They, the water don't taste right. What'd you do? Bring us over here to die in the wilderness? What, like the graves wasn't good enough back in Egypt? That's why God said, be angry and sin not. That's so that preachers don't hit people. Because you want to smack them in the head when they start talking like that. But standing there at the Red Sea with the Egyptian army rolling up behind you, kind of mad since they had just done, dug a bunch of holes and buried their babies in them. They got a score to settle. You'd better have a pretty good idea what your God can do before you find yourself in that hard spot. You'd better realize real quick whether or not you really trust the Lord before you find yourself with a whole army of people trying to kill you on purpose. They weren't looking to take hostages. They was looking for revenge. But it happens, speaking of revenge, happens all the time, marriage counseling. We try to do all the counseling ahead of time so that we don't have to do it afterwards. And I tell people all the time, hey man, you can run. She's over there right now with getting all of her pictures made and all that. We, I, I'll just let her and the photographer keep taking pictures. You run. Run. You could be half out, way out of the county. They won't even know where to start looking for you. No, I'm going to marry him. Okay. I'll go tell him. She's as crazy as you are. Are you sure you don't want to run? <laughs> you know, I'll talk to him. I'll talk to her. You can get out of here, man. He's back there fooling around with the stupid groomsmen. They're all a bunch of idiots. Are you sure you want to pick one out of that lot? Is that the only picking you had out of those four or five guys? That's all you had to pick from? In this whole world, you narrowed it down to that group and that one. Are you serious? In, when we do premarital counseling, I always try to talk them out of it. People are like, are you trying to talk us out of getting married? Oh, yeah. I'd rather you guys fight it out now and just break up than have a divorce later. That's expensive. Might as well just save the money and like go get a new car or something. Because, hey, I'd rather you go pick out your own car that you know you can have than fight over who gets one later when the divorce happens. No, I'm in love. Well, you better figure out what happens. She's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
You should just ask her to wash her face one time real hard <laughs> and make sure she's still as beautiful as you think she is. She may not be. He's such a good guy. You ought to talk to some of his coworkers. You ought to talk to, find out who, who, which of his relatives hate him and then find out why. Hey, I'd rather you find out why they hate him and you call it off now than you hate him for the same reason later. And all of a sudden you and half of his family sitting around singing Kumbaya hating on him. I'd rather just have one wedding and no divorces. When you get in the middle of a fight with your spouse, that is not the time to try to decide whether or not you're going to stay. Look up in here. It ain't praying time. We done had praying time. We'll have it again later. Right now it's preaching time. When you're in the middle of a fight with your spouse, that is not the time to come up with the genius idea of do I stay or do I go? No! No! You held hands in front of everybody. Hey, we asked you, do you promise to love, honor, cherish? Why are you a liar not doing that? Sickness and in health. Richer for poor. In good times, and I promise they're coming. Bad times. Bad times are coming, honey. No, I love her so much. Man, that's going to wear off. I, I've been doing this too long to even be nice about it. I tell the girls, girls. He's a guy, he's as dumb as a stump. Man. You better be careful. His eyes will wander. You better make sure his eyes don't wander. You better, you know, you better figure out who he really is. And then these guys are like, she's just the best preacher. She's the best in the whole wide world. I'm like, I just want you to consider one thing, boys. Somebody else already got sick and tired of her. That's why she's available to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just throwing it out there, right? what I'm saying. If she was absolute perfection, she wouldn't have been on the market for you to even look at. You better figure out what happens when it wears off. You better figure out what you're going to do. And if you ain't in it for life, why don't you just stay single? It'd be a lot easier. But our problem is, no, we're going to do it. We're going to go in and, oh, it's a mountaintop, mountaintop, mountaintop. I don't even want to do a wedding for folks that hadn't fought yet. I'll try to pick a fight in counseling. Y'all to fight about something, I'll just pick a fight. Y'all fight about it. Come back next week. We'll talk about things. If they don't back, make, come back next week, they don't have a wedding. I'm good. Save them the heartbreak. I don't want them, I don't want them making decisions when they're in the valley. Everybody loves everybody on wedding day. You even love your mother-in-law, future mother-in-law on your wedding day. I love mine even after that. <laughs> hey, everybody loves everybody on wedding day. But it don't take long for the shiny to wear off that thing. It don't take long for things to get ruined. And you'd better know where you stand and you better know you're willing to stay in the fight no matter what. Till death do you part. If you're still breathing, you keep trying. You know, at my house, even when I was single, I didn't wait till I heard a glass break in the middle of the night to decide how I was going to handle it. You're laying in bed with your spouse or you're single or whatever, and all of a sudden you hear glass breaking at 3 o'clock in the morning. That's not the time to go, well, let's see. Should I get a knife? Do I? I wonder where that baseball bat is. You know, I just, I wonder what I should do. What's the number to 911? <laughs> you had better have a plan in place. You just, you just heard glass break, man. I hear glass break at my house. My wife hadn't even said, did you hear that? I'm already, I'm already doing the combination on the gun safe. 
She's like, what happened? I was like, I'm about to find out. I'm already down the hall with a pistol in my hand. You, you keep a gun by your bed? Amongst other places. What are you scared of? I got 17 rounds in my pistol. I ain't scared of nothing. Right. Nothing. I picked it. I trained with it. I practice. I keep it close. I keep it clean. I keep it hot. I don't have to go, is the safety on? It ain't. Is there one in the chamber? There is. It's locked, cocked, and ready to rock all the time. Why? Because every single day I wake up prepared for the worst day of my life. And my job is to protect my family and I've got stuff to do for the Lord. I ain't got time to die right now because somebody has nefarious plans. So I get up ready to take care of me and mine. Glass break. What happened? What happened? No, no, what's about to happen? My kids know. They hear, they do something in the middle of the night. Somebody got it. They trip over something. They're like, I'm okay, Dad. It's just me. I'm like, uh-huh. Yeah. They all know, man, anything bad happens in our house, they hear Daddy coming down the hall, just lay on the floor. Lay on the floor. We prepare. We prepare. Remember when we was kids and, and they'd have the little, they'd ring the bells and you'd go get, get under your desk or out in the hallway and duck and cover and all that. So you don't wait until a tornado. Go, tornado's coming, tornado's coming. What are we going to do? No, you practice and you're prepared. Fire drill, the building's on fire. Where do we go? Do we, can we just sit here and scream? No. Line up quickly and quietly. Exit the building. Get out, get out. Go to a safe place. You know where to go. You don't wait until the house is on fire to decide what to do. You don't wait until the bad guy comes in to decide what to do. You don't wait until problems come in your life and try to make a plan and a decision. You need to have those plans in place like David, like, like Elijah, like Moses, like Paul, like all these people in the scriptures that God has given us. You need to have a plan in place. There's people laying on their deathbed. Laying on her deathbed. Half the family's going, did his breathing slow down enough? Can we unplug him? Can we unplug him? And by the way, the house is mine, the truck is mine, and they're already divided. You're just, you're just sick, man. You're trying to still get better. They're divvying up your stuff. You know, daddy never wanted to be put on a respirator. You're like, no, it's an asthma inhaler, man. He's just, he's okay. He's just having an asthma attack. <laughs> Give that here, daddy. You didn't want to be on life support, did you? Some kids are just waiting. They're circling like vultures, waiting to take their parents' stuff. Yeah. Man, you ought to have a living will in place before you get sick so your family knows what to do. I know some people are like, here's me. If I can't function and the doctors are saying it don't look good, listen, just let me go home. Amen. Just Brother Jason knows. He's cold-hearted. He'll crimp the hose. He'll stand on a tube or something. He knows. I'm going home. I ain't trying to live on a bunch of machines forever. I'm too close. If, hey, if I'm that close to the house, let me go. That's the way I want it. There's other people like, no, if I'm laying there a month and you see like one pinky twitch, keep me alive. I might come back. I, that's not me. But that's, hey, you better make sure your family knows what you want so you can speak for yourself when you can't speak. You're like, well, when, my, when I pass away, I want this to go here and there. Hey, your kids are going to fight over it. Not my kids. Man, I tell you what, I love a good funeral, but I hate it when people die. It brings out the worst in their families. You, the coroner hadn't even determined the, the time of death and they're already divvying up your stuff. Hey, when you're laying there on your deathbed and your kids are over there counting, trying to get in your checkbook, see what's left, that's not the time to figure out who gets what. You better have that in place ahead of time. In our spiritual life, in our spiritual life, you better not wait until something pops up on your, on your computer screen to decide 
what you're going to look at and what you're not going to look at. When I was a little kid, we had those pay-per-view shows, and if you didn't pay for them, they were scrambled. In my family, I didn't have any biblical training. I was watching the scrambled channels like, what? Can I make out something? What? What? It was terrible. You're like, I don't know if I saw something or not. I might have been an alien. I don't know. But you knew it was a bad channel. You better decide. Hey, lady, you better decide what you're going to do when some guy flirts with you. Hey, dude, you better decide what you're going to do when some woman comes up to you at work talking about, I hope your wife knows how lucky she is. Because you think they're complimenting your wife. They're not. Because if I had a man like you, you ought to be like, you heifer, you better get out of here. <laughs> My wife will call your eyeballs out. And I don't think she can get off three times. I think the jury might get her this time. The last two women that did that, rest their sorry souls. I'm just not going to tell my wife you said that this time. I hope the district attorney, he'll get nervous. They're going to lock my wife up to protect you. She'll claw your eyeballs out. You ever heard of Helen Keller? Yeah, she, flirt, she flirted with me. Because here's the deal. They'll catch you when you're weak. They'll catch you when you had a fight at home. They'll catch you when your wife didn't say I love you on the way out the door. She's like, we'll talk later. And you ain't wanting to talk later. You want to go to work and you're hoping it's overtime. You're hoping to make you work till she's asleep. And then some woman comes up and starts flirting with you. Hey man, you better already know what you're going to do. You better have a plan in place. Hey, kids. Hey, grown-ups. Somebody's going to offer you some dope. You would better decide ahead of time what you're going to do. You better decide ahead of time. It's not a matter of if. It, it's, it's when. It's when. You're going to be offered drugs at some point in your life. I got offered drugs in January at a church. At a revival. We, we were on a revival at sea. Revival at sea. We had 78 people in our group. I had a, I had a bus full of people. I'm riding with, with the, the tour operator and my family and, and other Christian folks, man. And we went to go look at a church and visit this church. Right out in front. Had been there 10 seconds. I got Get out of here with that junk. The lady said, if anybody offers you something you don't want it, just say, no me want it. I just got off and walked past all the other guys, walked up and said, hey, no me want it, and they don't want it either. <laughs> you better know what you're going to do. My, my decision was really easy because, listen, I got over trying to be cool when I was in junior high. Some of you guys are pitifully, pitifully still trying. It's not working. Get over it and move on. I watched my older sisters destroy their lives. If it wasn't for drugs and alcohol, my sister Beverly would still be alive today. I just watched a lot of tragedy happen. I watched what happens because alcohol, cigarettes, leads to alcohol, alcohol leads to weed, weed leads to more, and it leads to more, and leads to more. People are not shooting heroin in their arm first time. Nobody comes out and says, oh really, I've never done any drugs today. Do you have any tar heroin? <clears throat> what is that? I heard on the TV that we're doing the, uh, a flock of. I'd like to just jump right off and become a zombie day one. Do you have any of that, what do they call it, meth, methamphetamine? No. They start smoking cigarettes, trying to look cool, and then they steal some uh, uh, liquor out of their parents' cabinet that should have been there in the first place, or they just go down the street and finally that gets them. You'd better watch out, because 
Starts here, goes to there. Next thing you know, you're snorting it up your nose, you're shooting it in your arms, you're smoking it, and you're doing prison time. Hey, you'd better decide, honey. You'll be coming out and you're in a recycle. And can I tell you something else? And this ought to scare you to death. When you start, when you start smoking weed or doing any other kind of drug of your choice, that is where you stop maturing. Have you ever met somebody who's like 35 years old and they still talk like a 15-year-old? That's when they start smoking weed. Just when you realize that somebody's a fool and you're talking to them and you realize how foolish they talk and you realize they just sound like an idiot and, and they're way too old. And, you know, they're 45 years old. And you, hey, man, hey, dude, we're doing this and that. And they, you all just kind of go, you know what? Let me ask you a question. Did you start experimenting with drugs when you was about 14? And just watch. My experience is, when you talk to people, their maturity level, their, their maturity skills just turn off when the drugs start. And until they've been off of drugs for a long time, they don't restart. Now, they may go to jail and just get hard, and that's, that's different. That's not maturing. That's just taking a different route altogether. But listen, the time to find out there's a whole bunch of potheads talking about, what, do I act like that? Yeah, yeah, you do. Don't wait till you're in the ditch to try to make a decision on what to do when you're in the ditch. You can't wait till you're in the middle of the storm before you decide that you trust in Jesus. You can't wait until you're having marital problems to decide if you're going to stick it out. You can't wait until you see the safe open or the, or the cash register drawer open if you do, or, your, or money hanging out of your mama's purse. You can't wait till that moment when nobody's looking to decide if you're going to be a thief or not. You have to make decisions in your life. Joshua gets to this place. And you've got to remember the, 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 the situation here is that Joshua was faithful to God all the way through. Joshua has gray hair. Caleb has gray hair. Nobody else has gray hair. For 40 years, God systematically, the Bible says, overthrew them in the wilderness. Just let them die. Let them die. Let them die. Let them die. Why? Because they wouldn't go forward. Joshua says, I'm going forward. Caleb says, I'm in it. I done seen it. But hey, hey, Joshua. Caleb here. When we get over there and y'all start divvying up the land, you better remember the mountain I called. That was mine. He gets over there like an 80-something-year-old man. There he's about, oh, we'll go over here and fight them. And he goes, hey, don't forget. Hey, that's my mountain. By the way, there's a bunch of giants up there. I'm going to go up and kill them all, and I'll be back to talk to you about it, but that's my mountain. I've been waiting to clear those jokers out for 40 years. Why? He had a plan, and he was ready. These kids had only seen their unfaithful parents fail and die in the wilderness. All they had ever seen was failure, failure, failure in their own homes. And they got a couple old men they could look to. They used to look to Moses. God killed him too. Two old men just leading the way. And Joshua says, hey, you better decide. Are you going to live like your mom and daddy? Or are you going to do what God wants you to do? Choose you this day. Whom you going to serve? You can live like that nonsense. But me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. I ain't having no failure up in here. I ain't going to go the route. Everybody I went to school with is dead and gone. Every, all my neighbors are dead and gone. All I got is you young whippersnappers. Y'all going to do something or not? You want to die like your parents? Or you want to come on and let's do something? He didn't decide on that day. When Moses died, Joshua had already been faithful and faithful and faithful. And on top of his faithfulness, when you go over to Joshua chapter number one, you get down there, I think it's verse five and six, and 
8, 9, right in that area, over and over again, God says, Be strong and of a good courage, Joshua. Be strong and of a good courage. Only be thou strong and of a good courage. Have not I commanded you? Be strong and of a good courage. God laid it down, man. Joshua had decided a long time ago. Rough times are coming. Have you decided? Rough times are coming in your life. I hate to even think about it, but in my life. And I'm blessed beyond measure. But even in my life. We knew what we were going to do before my wife got diagnosed with cancer. You go, oh, wow, are y'all special? No, God's special. And we just knew he was going to take care of it. So we didn't sit around and whine and cry about it. We just kept doing what we were doing because we knew it was what God wanted us to do. That didn't make us superheroes. We just modeled in the lives of the people that we've read about and studied about in the Bible who God used to do something big. I'm a nobody white trash out of South Irving. But I want to do something big for God. And if I'm going to do something big for God, I'm going to have to trust Him. I'm going to have to be faithful even through the storm. And I can't wait till the storm to make those decisions. I decided a long time ago, and I just keep up re-upping on my decisions as I go. Where are you at today? Are you ready for the next storm? Are you ready for the next temptation? Are you ready for the next disaster in your life? It, I hate it, but it's coming. Unless Jesus takes us out of here, you drop dead this afternoon. It's coming. Friend, you need to be ready. You need to be ready. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're here and you're a lost person, you are not ready. You are not ready. You go, hey, I'm a nice guy. Okay. I'm a good person. Compared to who? My friends can depend on me. When you die, you'll be the nicest person in hell without Jesus. Don't wait till you're... You will not wait until you stand before God to decide you're going to believe in Him. You are not going to wait until you stand before Jesus Christ to decide to put your trust in Him. There will come a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But for many, it will be too late. I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. And you'll be cast into the lake of fire. Nicest guy, nicest lady in hell. We get it when a Saddam Hussein gets it. You understand when a Hitler gets it? You get it when some mass murderer gets it. I wish they would have gotten saved and not done those terrible things. But you understand those people going to hell. What I don't understand is the sweet little old lady that, that, that runs the cash register up at the grocery store. What I don't understand is these Eagle Scouts, these, these football coaches who poured their life into trying to mentor some young men, do all that stuff. And, and they were trying to get them to have better character, better character, better character. And instead, they just got them all involved in sports and never got them involved in Christ and let them all go to hell. Yeah. Maybe Joel Osteen's right. Maybe you are having your best life now. <laughs> if you're on your way to hell, this is it. That's the best as it's ever going to get. Right. Keep coughing and getting sick, going to the doctor. Keep, keep, you, hey, you're playing Russian roulette with an automatic. It's, it's your turn. You better decide now if you're going to trust in Jesus. Yeah. If you're here today and you ain't trusted in Jesus, hey, you better let one of us show you in the Bible in a minute how to be saved. Yeah. And if you have trusted in Christ and you do know you're going to heaven, then why are you falling apart every time something happens? You talk about, I read the back of the book and we win. Well, why are you losing every step of the way? Why do you fail in every temptation? Why, why do you fall apart at every disaster? Why do you sit at home and cry and depress at every little disappointment? You need to grow up and bow up. Do what God
God's called you to do. It ain't sitting around having a bad testimony every time something happens. Not your little heads up and down. That's exactly right. Amen. God ain't called you to fail, 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 fail. I'm talking about winning at the end. Get a couple of victories in. Amen. You want to do something for God? Decide now. Amen. Don't wait till the giant's standing before you and he's got his sword out. Don't wait till you're out in the middle of the, out in the, middle of the sea and the, the boat's shaking all over the place and filling up with water. Let's just decide now that we love him and we believe him. We're going to do anything he wants us to do no matter what. Amen. Be ye strong and of good courage. We've already decided we're going to serve the Lord. But everybody has to decide. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Lord, with this many people here, surely there's probably a couple of people that aren't even saved. They know it, you know it, and they're a little embarrassed about it. Lord, would you help them to get over themselves and just step out and come let us show them the Bible finally how to be saved? It'd be a wonderful miracle today if you just saved somebody. They can be part of your plan today if they just get saved. And Lord, save folks. Struggle. We live in this flesh and we struggle. We're not prepared. We need that spiritual jack in the trunk. We need that spiritual triple A. We need, we need the, the, the wall and the protection. And we need to stop relying on our emotions and our own thoughts and our own wisdom. And we need to trust in you completely. Lord, I just pray that Maybe today would be the day somebody would make a decision that they're tired of failing. And they just want to give it to you because they know something's coming and they might as well be ready for it. Lord, whatever your will, I pray that you'd have your, your perfect way and will. We'd submit to you today in Jesus' name with thanksgiving.